Picture this, you were a worker at Kodak in the year 1945, at the time the biggest company that sold cameras and film in the US. The day starts as usual, you get to your office, receive a package that came from one of your facilities that contains a box full of film from one of your selected partners. But the usual part of your day ends here, because in the film you can see with your naked eye some dots that make it appear the film was burnt with something and it is effectively ruined. Instead of phoning the site and asking what's going on, you recognize the pattern they made and dust off an old Geiger counter which can help you check for radiation levels. With its help, you identify the material that has caused the damage, cerium-141. The only logical explanation is that an atomic bomb exploded nearby and caused the damage. The thing is, at the time, not many people even know what an atomic bomb is. Kodak had discovered something they weren't supposed to. And that, among other things we will get to in a moment, led to the downfall of a company that once helped bring the US and the world at large together through movies, news reports, and some of the first cameras available to the public. This is the story of the rise and fall of Kodak. Let's start from the beginning with the story of George Eastman, born on the 12th of July, 1854. He was the youngest child in a rural family in Waterville, New York. They later moved to Rochester because of his father's deteriorating health, only to lose him anyway just two years later. Finding himself in a bizarre economic situation, George left school at the age of 15 and started to work to support his mother and sister. But in his heart, he knew the world of photography would have a place for him and his ideas. It is not clear how much time George spent trying to get the film in roll technology to work, but he managed to patent it by 1884 when he was 30 years old. Four years later, when he was able to create the camera that would use his newfound film, on the 4th of September, he and Harry A. Strong created the Eastman Kodak Company. It is hard to understand how important this invention was at the time. Eastman and his company took only 12 years to become the international leader in film stock making him not only a millionaire, but thanks to his humble beginnings, quite a philanthropist to boot. He donated millions to universities and health research facilities in the US while he was alive and even saved enough money to build himself a mansion in which he held private concerts for him and his friends. Now that George got the ball rolling on his new business, things started to really take off. He adopted a model similar to one of the disposable razor blade market, selling cheap cameras but with not so cheap complimentary items like film, chemicals, and papers. He worked at the company until 1925, when he decided to leave and focus on his own health. For years now, he had suffered from a spinal disorder that got worse with the years. Until 1932, he decided to take his own life with a gunshot to the chest at the age of 77. Eastman lived to witness the first attempts made by Kodak to develop colored pictures, but didn't live to see how the innovative technology with the potential to skyrocket the company's profits to even greater heights would also begin the company's demise. Give Kodak gifts for Christmas, take pictures, save the fun, and share your Merry Christmas days with everyone. Give Kodak gifts for Christmas, take all the Christmas cheer, to live again, enjoy again, year after year. Kodak was in an incredibly comfortable position at this time. They managed not only to maintain themselves as the ruler of the industry, but they kept other small businesses that tried to compete with them as partners to have them in check at all times. This worked for many years. As late as 1976, Kodak commanded 90% of film sales and 85% of camera sales in the US, as well as having a big presence in the international market. But what happened? How and why did this behemoth drop the ball so quickly? As Kodak began to lose its main revenue source from the sale of film, they turned back to their licenses and tried their hand at legal jiu-jitsu. In 2010, they reached a settlement with LG, where LG would pay $838 million. This surge of cash bought them a bit of time until 2012, when they filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy. This is not the best way of making friends in the industry, and shortly after they ran out of people to sue, not many other big companies wanted to work with Kodak. The impact of the rise of smartphones had on Kodak is pretty easy to understand. Worldwide, the amount of photos taken has risen each and every year. Analog cameras started strong. 
as they were the only option. But with the development of digital cameras, their sales plummeted. Digital photos took their place in the span of fewer than five years as they did everything better and faster than film. But then phones came around and with just a couple of years, they managed to include the technology necessary to capture great pictures with the camera you always have with you, your phone. Of course, the camera in your phone, even in newer models, can't compete with a proper film camera with its bigger sensors and greater collection of lenses. At least not until the rise of computational photography, which is a topic for another day. But as Chase Jarvis brings up in his book, the best camera is the one that's with you. The ubiquity of the ever-present smartphone was just too much for Kodak to compete with. We are left with two reasons, the invention per se of digital cameras and the strange compliance with the US government. The first is strictly economical, while the second, even though you may not know it, delivered a fatal blow to the public's opinion about the company. How could the invention of the digital camera bring down the company that invented it and patented it? It seemingly doesn't make sense. That is until you realize that while they did attempt a digital transformation, they weren't particularly good at it. So great was the company's reliance on the sale of their film for their revenue that they failed to see how selling digital cameras that needed no film could possibly be as lucrative. The obvious answer, at least for Kodak, was to draw out the process and make the shift to digital as long as possible. A seemingly terrible idea. The first year in which their film sales dropped was 2001, but the company was convinced that it was because of the attack of 9-11 and that their business would recover just fine in a few months with a bit of marketing. 9-11 caused big shocks to a variety of companies, but in the case of Kodak, this is not really the main problem. The incredible money-making machine that George Eastman had built was starting to fall apart, and it was falling apart quickly. Kodak was losing ground to companies like Canon, Sony, and Nikon, and many others in their home market of the US, which was historically their best performer. Nearing the 2010s, their financial situation was dire enough to warrant laying off almost 30,000 people and shuttering numerous factories around the country. But surely a name as legendary as Kodak would have the brand loyalty and reputation to stay afloat long enough to figure out a new strategy, right? If Apple, for example, were to enter a financial crisis, the mere name Apple Inc. would help them to stay afloat for a bit longer, thanks to the power of its brand. So why did this not happen with Kodak? Well, the answer is that it may have happened, at least a little bit. Remember that Geiger counter incident? Well, that's something that would come back to haunt them a few years down the line. When they detected the radiation in 1945, they called the Department of Energy because they were preoccupied that something very bad had happened. The response they got was that everything was A-OK -okay and that if they keep it cool and don't tell anybody, things would get even cooler. Kodak wasn't very involved with the US government at that time. They were leased a bit of money back in 1936 to develop hand grenades, but it was common for companies to try and get a hang during war times or near war times. But in this case, the government decided to keep Kodak informed about when and where the nuclear tests will be done so that their films would not get harmed and even paid them back for the inconvenience. The first report about this that we could find was published on the 30th of September in 1997 by Matthew L. Wade in the New York Times under the title of U.S. Alerted Photo Filmmakers Not Public About Bomb Fallout. As you may be thinking, this was not exactly well received by the public. The company now had made two very questionable decisions, and the consequence was obvious, a decline in sales in favor of the competition who at least weren't complicit with nuclear fallout billowing down on nearby inhabitants. And where are they now? I mentioned a few minutes ago that the company went bankrupt in August 2012, but that was not the end. Just a year later, and after they sold many of their patents, they were valued at approximately $525 million. They resurfaced from bankruptcy in the 3rd of September 2013. Kodak is still going, I won't say strong compared to their competitors, and they are down, but they are not out. Kodak has around 5,000 employees today, and while they're not at their strongest, they did receive a small loan of close to $800 million from the US government so that they can shift their production a bit towards pharmaceutical materials and equipment and help with the response to the coronavirus pandemic. This will surely keep the company afloat for long enough for the board of directors to decide where they want to go from here. After declaring bankruptcy, Kodak announced that it would stop making digital cameras, pocket video cameras, and digital picture frames and focus on the corporate digital imaging market. This, in addition to the $800 million loan, may be the beginning of a new era at Kodak. We will have to wait and see where their story goes from here.